Assalamu alaikum friends welcome to lecture 8 of SBL reporting to stakeholders so in this we are going to focus on development of corporate governance regarding shareholders and disclosure institutional investors general meetings disclosure mandatory versus voluntary disclosure so the main theme is disclosure how do you disclose okay then we are going to focus on sustainability effects of economic activity management systems emas and is or 14000 these are there in your syllabus you need to go through that social and environmental audit social and environmental reporting integrated reporting very important okay because most of the time integrated reporting has been asked regarding social reporting or sustainability reporting uh, very high chances of that also occurring in your exam so let us start with how corporate governance has developed okay regarding two aspects one is shareholder the other one is disclosure okay so this started in 1992 okay there's a report called cadbury report which is uh, which came into effect from 1992 okay you don't need to know these details this is there for you to understand that life cycle of corporate governance how it came into the picture okay the various reports that came how corporate governance progressed to know that timeline this is the included you don't have to know the details of this okay so cadbury report but you need to know that in this report what is the main idea this the main idea is that they recognize the importance and role of institutional shareholders so the first time that institutional shareholders has been given importance is under Cadbury report in 1992. Okay, later we are going to cover what is institutional shareholders. Okay, institutional shareholders, just know briefly for now, they are shareholders who are very wealthy. Okay, they manage funds of various companies. Okay, on behalf of someone else, on behalf of the actual shareholders. Their institutional shareholders are very wealthy. Okay, they can invest in. They have investment in various companies. So that is known as institutional shareholders because they are very wealthy. They have share shareholdings in various companies. They are very powerful. That's why their importance is very important in corporate governance. That's why we have a separate section also on institutional shareholders. Institutional shareholders is one type of stakeholder which is very commonly asked in exam compared to other stakeholders. Okay, in my earlier lectures, we went through the types of stakeholders, right? Customer, supplier, employee. Institutional shareholder is one such stakeholder, but it's very important. Significance is more compared to other stakeholders regarding corporate governance. Okay. So in Cadbury report, what they told that they need a greater director dialogue. That means you have to have a communication with the director, the shareholder, this institutional shareholder needs to communicate with the director of the company. Okay. Because there should be a transparent transparency, which is uh, within the control and the ownership. As I told you, governance took place. Why? Because there's a separation of ownership and control in companies. Right, director is the one who is uh, controlling, they're running it, and shareholders are the one who is owning it. They are the shareholders, okay? But they do not know what's happening in day-to-day -day activity. That's why it's very important that they communicate, okay? So once they communicate with this, they will be able to understand the needs of other stakeholders, okay? Because the main idea of this lecture is what disclosure. Everything you will find out is regarding disclosure only. Various forms of disclosure. Because the I, what is the topic? Reporting to stakeholders. How do you report to stakeholders? By through disclosure, through various reports that you are going. That's why we are going to study integrated reporting, sustainability reporting, environmental reporting, all those stuff. Then, again in 2010, what happened? UK Corporate Governance Code came. Okay. What did they conclude? They told that it is shareholders they have to monitor. Okay, they have a huge importance in monitoring. Okay, so they also told interact with the board. The shareholders have to interact with the board of directors. Okay, in this report also, that came UK corporate governance. Can you follow that timeline from 1992 Cadbury report, then 2010? 
then came 2016 UK Corporate Governance Court. They also recommend that there should be a dialogue with shareholder. Okay, so in all the three main ideas, dialogue with shareholder. Now, to this, what can you understand? Generally, if I ask you that the board is accountable to shareholder, they have a responsibility. Okay, that they should take, uh, they should have a dialogue with the shareholders, a proper satisfactory dialogue. That means they cannot hide what is happening in the company from the shareholder any longer. They have to disclose it to the shareholder. Because remember, the board of directors, they are agent. Remember agency theory? They are working on behalf of the shareholder, so they need to, at the end of the day, they have they are answerable to the shareholder. They have to tell, okay, okay, these are the things that has been done. So you have to disclose. Okay, there are various ways, meetings and all, which is held, which we are going to cover later. Okay, so that's the main. Second topic is institutional investors. This itself is a topic on its own. Okay, very important. So, as I told you, they are institutional investors. They manage funds that are invested by individuals. Okay, as investors, we invest in various uh, fund and all. So what, what does institutional investors do? Their role is to manage those funds because you cannot manage everywhere. You don't know which company is growing, which company is not declining. It is the role of the institutional investors. They, through their research and through their wealth that they accumulate, they can better manage your fund than you can do. They can manage your funds, your money better than you can do as an investor, individual investor. Because you, on a scale, you are very small, right? You have a, you have a um, cap beyond which you cannot go because you have limited finance but institution investors they are very huge okay examples like these are the four examples four types of institution investors that are found in uk not only in uk in other countries also like pension fund the one who manages pension okay very huge because every individual requires pension every individual so to manage that fund you need you institution investors right next we have life assurance company then we have unit trust then we have investment trust these are the four types you don't want to know in depth how they are run and what is that just know that these are the four types of institution investors because in the exam what happens sometimes they might give you a company or a pension company or a insurance company so in that case you you should be in a position to identify that this is an institution investor okay now, what is the importance of institution investors? Why this stake, particular stakeholder is so important compared to others? Number one, because they have a dominant, they are dominating, and that dominance is increasing day by day. Okay, so this group can positive, they can have a positive contribution on the governance. Okay, why? Because the power is only in few hands. As I told you, not everyone will handle pension funds. It's only very few investors but they are very uh, wealthy so the power is in few hands okay next sec second reason why they're important is they're very skilled at that because they've been managing funds from various other investors it's not just you alone that your fund only is uh, managing no all the investors their fund is managed by this institution investors put together okay so they have a skill and wide range of expertise to manage okay but there are problems also on the other hand what are the problem because ownership and control is separated this is from day one i have been telling you when i started the topic governance everything whatever you are going to study under governance stem from this very simple reason owners and control ownership and control are different in two different hands that's why all these problems are there so that means you need people in vitamin, right? So because there are people in vitamin, it is creating a complex web of agency relationship. Earlier, it's very easy. If you hire someone to do your work, you are the principal, he's the agent. It's one-to-one -one. relationship is very clear. He's accountable to you, you ask questions. But now, because a middle person comes in vitamin, that agency relationship becomes more difficult, more complex, can you understand? Just visualize, okay? Investor, okay? Pension fund trustee. Then pension fund manager is there. 
company okay so investor is on one hand okay then we have pension fund trustee then we have a manager company so in this few areas you are going to have that problem these are few of the intermediates that can come in very well now what are the problems that can arise because they are having a dominance institution do shareholders number one short termism of fund managers fund managers they will always be working for short term not over a long period of time if shareholders are dominating second problem is lack of skill of trustees maybe their trustees that you are telling who is going to manage your fund maybe they might not have the skills third reason lack of influence maybe individual shareholders might not be able to influence so now we are moving on to the next shareholder activism this is a new term you must have come across what is it looking at the word activism means you are very active you are taking part right you are participating in short so the advent of the cadbury report and the code okay this are uk example only remember they are not outside uk so they have seen that there is a change in institutional investor relationship with the organization okay so earlier it was what you could be very passive you just have some shares just invest just manage the fund you might not have to directly get involved with the board of the directors of the company or nothing like that you are very passive now you are being more active now okay you are actively uh, taking part to 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 have a dialogue with the shareholder to communicate with them earlier it was passive you invest in whatever company and you don't in, uh, you don't have a communication with the shareholder involved in that company while you are investing or managing the fund but now no it's not like that any longer this can be in various form this activism okay making positive use of voting rights maybe you can make some positive use of this voting right that's how you can be more uh, active to take uh, to communicate with the shareholder or you can have a dialogue with the directors of the investing companies third paying attention to the board composition how the board is composed do we have too much of young people or old people or mixed of them the gender female male based on expertise governance of the investing companies okay you have to evaluate the governance disclosure how they are disclosing their governance issue the one where you are investing you have to see this so this will help you to uh, get involved with the shareholder okay communicate with them next presenting resolutions for voting on the agm agm is annual general meeting okay this is rarely used in uk the fourth form maybe you are giving some resolutions where you can vote at agm requesting an egm and presenting resolutions egm means extraordinary general meeting which is not very frequent okay we are going to go in depth what is agm and egm in detail so then we are moving on to institutional shareholder intervention now in what places they can intervene what are the scenarios under which they can intervene okay intervention by an institution invest in a company whose stock it holds is considered to be a radical step most of the time they do not intervene but where they intervene means something serious must have happened in the company it's a very radical step okay so there are there should be number of conditions that should exist before an institution shareholder can come and inter uh, intervene okay for example and this situations by the way make make a note of this you should know it because in the exam Uh, this this is asked frequently it's asked one strategy okay where you need to build up a strategy proper strategy strategy means uh, terms of products that has to be sold or market which market you are going to product market your product if you want to expand are you going to go by the organic growth or you are going to go by acquisition all those things for this strategy to set up a proper strategy institution investor has to come and intervene second operational performance sometimes what happens divisions which are not performing so well you might have to sell them so there you need to decide whether you have to sell them or keep it institution investors will come again and 
intervene. Third, accusation and disposal. Okay. This might be in terms of executive decisions that have been indicately challenged by non-executive director. Maybe board of directors feels that they have to go through an accusation, but non-executive director feels that they should not. It's not good for the company. Their institution investor should come and intervene. Okay. Remuneration policy. Where remuneration policy is failing. Okay, they are failing to set up a proper remuneration uh, system or a package for the executive director. Okay, then institutional investors will come and play a role there. This this is further okay, the same thing. Why they will intervene? Internal control. If it relates, maybe health and safety must have failed, or quality control failed, or budgetary control, no budgetary control. Institutional investors has to come and control. Succession planning. Maybe succession planning means when someone is leaving, you have to plan someone in the place in the place of him or her. So if you are failing, okay, on how to balance the board composition, then institutional investors will come and recommend. They will do the succession planning for you. Okay. Because sometimes it happens that you might be recommending someone based on whom you know. Maybe he or she might not be fit for that role. But you're understanding. So, again, it's a failure of succession planning. Social responsibility. Maybe you are not uh, responding to the environmental uh, issues. Right? Your product, you're uh, building in a factory. You're making it in a uh, factory. Nearby, there are seas and river which is getting affected, pollution, water pollution, air pollution, th things like that. So you're not taking a social responsibility. Institutional investors has to come in. What? Play their role there, right? Failure to comply with relevant codes when you're not complying with the relevant codes. For example, you are going, departing from the compliance and you're not even explaining also. Okay, then you'll be penalized by the market. See, if it's a rule-based country where you go by the rule, it's very easy for you to penalize. You don't follow the rule, it will be taken in the matter. It will be followed according to the law. You'll be punished. But if it's a, in a principle-based country, you'll be penalized by the market. Okay, not by the law, but by the market. How by, by the market? See, failure to relevant codes. Let's say corporate governance code you are not following. You are not being ethical. You are not taking care of the customer. Automatically, customer will not purchase from you. They will punish you. They will go and buy from your competitor. So this is known as penalized by the market. So, to understand this better, why institution investor is so important, let us go through this illustration. Okay. So this is according to OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Okay. They told that in 2008, I'm sure all of you know what happened in 2008, the financial crisis, right? The credit crunch, where everyone suffered, the world suffered. So there, in 2008, the crash wiped a total of how much? Five trillion dollars, five trillion dollars, such a big amount of the private pension funds in rich countries in just one single year, just one single year. Just see the impact on the society, the negative impact on the society. In 2008, because of the crash course, what happened? Five trillion dollar wiped away. Simply five trillion dollar in just one single year. And half of the total loss has been sustained by whom? The US investors. And then OECD calculated, third paragraph says they calculated the UK pension fund also that has declined in that single year. By more than 15% it has declined. That means 300 billion if you take it in terms of value. And it became more worse. Why? In 2008 because that time the property value, the cost of the property were taken into factor. They are also falling. Right? So if you factor, if you take that also in, into the consideration, the pro falling property value, it makes the situation even worse. 
maybe it might be more than 15 percent who knows this is just an estimate so they have studied 28 countries in that study and they found that irons workers were affected the most why because their retirement fund was falling by more than 30 percent you see worldwide pension fund was falling by 15 percent but ireland alone is falling by 30 percent and finally the last paragraph it says <coughs> that according to the findings of o oecd okay so they understood that there should be a need to strengthen your governance regulation all the companies need to be regulated very strongly they understood the importance and it should be through proper body okay that time it was financial service authority now it is called as financial conduct authority so they why were they set up to ensure that institutional shareholders who are the institutional shareholders we went through the types of shareholders right out of it one was pension fund so the large pension funds okay they have to carry out adequate risk management when they are managing the risk adequately they have to see of all the portfolio organization they might be investing in let's say i might be investing in five companies i have to see the risk of investing in those five countries so i just cannot simply rely on what what is known as index tracking there is some track some ranking system is there according to some index and all you don't need to know go in depth of what is index tra tracking or not if you want to know google it and find out okay because in the textbook it's not given what is index tra uh, tracking because this is I'm, i have taken this from your textbook only kaplan textbook as well so they do so do not simply just rely on ranking system to see okay i'm going to invest in company one two three because uh, they have been ranked high when you are going to invest no you have to see this also how well an institutional shareholders are managing their fund yes it's true that you might be having the money to spend in uh, 10 companies 20 companies uh, fund you can manage but it's not necessary that you have to manage if it's let's say one or two companies out of that portfolio is highly risky then do not invest simply so you have to follow that risk management very clearly very properly very strictly due diligence has to be carried out that is the role of the institution to shareholder that's why it's very important that institution shareholder have a dialogue with the company's board of directors okay because you see just now you saw the impact is very huge it was very huge it will be in the future now let us go to the general meetings there are two types of meetings in general meeting general meetings are those which are carried out in a organization so that the agent and the principal knows what's happening they meet together in that year okay it could be annual it could be even more frequent meetings but mostly we are interested in agm and egm agm is annual general meeting the word annual means annually once it happens in a year where all the discussions are have takes place so in this agm the features are once every calendar year it will be held legally required by the law it is required all the companies needs to go through this you cannot say it's optional and i will not go i will not be doing this meeting no every company needs to do one agm every year third separate resolutions are there for each issue each issue will be dealt separately and not less than 21 days notice required okay you cannot give short notice at least 21 days has to be there not less than means less than 21 days they will not accept if you want to invite people for the meeting there should be a gap of 21 days at least notice you should wait at least 21 days 21 days notice has to be there before 21 days you have to give the notice that means three weeks right roughly three weeks then first agm that will be held must be held no more than 18 months after the date of incorporation that means after the date of incorporation 18 months it should not exceed 18 months in eight that means one year and six months you should have your first agm and after that it should not be more than 15 months that means one year three months understanding
then all shareholders must be notified and entitled to attend okay you don't have to memorize these things they will not ask you these features what is it understanding we are more focused on why how agm will help in corporate governance how it will help to have a proper relationship with the shareholder we are more focused on that rather than this feature this feature is given to you so that you understand what is agm all about everything that is given in slide did not be memorized or will not be asked in the exam okay for example 21 days notice this 18 months 15 months is not required you don't need to memorize it don't buy hard all shareholders must be notified and entitled to attend remember everyone should be given the notification and they have to attend they are entitled to attend if for some reason if they cannot attend they can uh, tell someone to go on behalf of them that is called as proxy right proxy voting they can have proxy vote that person also can vote on behalf of you it is known as proxy voting then annual accounts and appointments of auditors if appropriate it will happen at this meeting if you have to appoint any new auditor or replace a i mean carry on the same auditor will be taken at this meeting will be discussed if it's appropriate now we are moving on to the next type of meeting that is egm extraordinary general meeting the word itself tells you it is not a frequent meeting like how agm is so it's not held on there is no timetable it can take place at any time of the year so if you require a meeting you take it could be four or five times a year but mostly uh, a egm should not be taken very frequently also okay it's rare that it will take four or five times because important issues urgent issues comes once or twice a year not more than that that's a no that like normally okay no legal obligation unlike agm it is required by law but egm is not required by law if you require you do it if you do not require don't do it separate res resolution same for agm not less than 14 days at least 14 days notice has to be sent before you can take a meeting it should not be less than 14 days there it was 21 days here is 14 days less short time because agm everyone will be attending so they should be be well aware of it at least three weeks here egm not so much of people less people might be or maybe if it's required for a particular issue that's why for time period is less here also all shareholders must be entitled to attend and notify agenda detected by need for the meeting what would be the agenda it's not the pre-planned if it goes by the need why that meeting is held okay based on that will be the agenda now governance best practice corporate governance requirement okay when you what are the best practice corporate governance requirement okay see governance and disclosure these two terms are very linked together they go hand in hand you cannot isolately take each one of these two things separately good disclosure means good governance bad disclosure means bad governance okay disclosure means how you communicate that governance how you show that you are uh, following the corporate governance regulations through disclosure okay so if you do that automatically it will lead to stakeholder scrutiny and st uh, shareholder activism that means automatically you are taking part you are having a dialogue with the shareholder then you are seeing how the stakeholders are performing you see automatically it will come when you're disclosing it will lead to that so code such as uk corporate governance code 2016 examples like this they provide best practice governance so how do you show that you are uh, following it you are going by this code or best practice governance through transparency of the code implementation and in its detail inclusion the annual report so put it in the annual report maybe in detail you can show or you can just show that you have gone you have implemented the code okay next these are some main points okay according to the uk code agm okay in the uk code that that means best practice says you have to have an agm then directors the role of the directors there they need to have a dialogue with that nomination committee has to be there uk code says that nomination committee only has to nominate people they only have to hire and fire audit committee obviously you need an auditor they will be auditing you need an audit committee separate 
and remuneration committee so this three committee has to be there there is one more committee which is risk committee not every organization has that committee by the way it's optional but this three committees must okay so now mandatory versus voluntary disclosure the word itself is very easy to understand mandatory means something required by law you have no option you do have you have no choice over there you have to disclose it voluntary is something which you have a choice you want you disclose you don't want you disclose but before i go into it what it is let us do a question small question test your understanding one on these two types of disclosure mandatory and voluntary disclosure test your understanding one so here you are supposed to give examples of these two type of disclosure mandatory and voluntary let us first go through mandatory disclosure which is required by law things like comprehensive statement of comprehensive income or statement of financial position statement of cash flows statement of changes in equity operating segmental information operating segmental information is also by the way compulsory now okay if you are having segments if you are a very big company it's not for the smes and small size companies then auditors report corporate governance disclosure okay such as remuneration report and some items in the director's report like summary of operating position these things are mandatory you have no choice over this you have to provide and in uk the business review is compulsory it's in only in uk business review not in any any other company country and risk information on capital cover okay you don't need to know need all, all those things okay okay next voluntary disclosure is something where you have a choice these are the four examples risk information you want to give risk of your product how risk it is then operating review then social and environmental information voluntary not yet mandatory and chief executives review so these are some voluntary disclosure now let us go into the detail of voluntary disclosure so in the annual report we all know that annual report is a mandatory or voluntary mandatory mandatory disclosure every company has to give annual report but there are some part in that report which are voluntary which if you want you disclose otherwise do not but it is considered a good practice to disclose okay things like one okay there are i think four or five things which are voluntary let us go one by one number one chairman and ceo statement regarding company position when you see a company report annual report just see very clearly there is one section for chairman and the ceo uh, ceo statements Th those are voluntary if you do not include also there is no harm in the report okay voluntary in the sense of that it is required of the it is the requirement of the court but just imagine if it was not there how hard it would be for you to understand the company's position most of the time you will not see any annual report where this two statements are not given nowadays every annual report has its day it looks like it's mandatory because every company has it just go and check any annual report of a company like starbucks or apple or just see anything it's there in google you will see several will see an example of format of annual report it's very important that you see these things practically before the exam don't disclose don't wait things to come up on the day of the exam you sh that should not be a approach for the examination of for this paper sbl it's very practical in nature lot of the things you need to do a lot of research on from your side don't expect everything will be in the textbook or everything i will provide in the lecture or it will because due to the time limit it's not possible for me to give every example or every uh, to demonstrate everything no it's not easy it's not practical also okay so wherever things that you need to do research i will be telling you that this is the area go and look for it so annual report also go and look for the sections okay next is business review formerly it was known as ofr of operating financial review okay that's what ofr stands for now it's known as business review okay this is also it's very detailed but it is in a non financial language why it's non financial language so that everyone not just the fin people who are literate in financial world everyone all the stakeholders who does not have the financial knowledge also can understand what is there okay not just some sophisticated uh, accountants or analysts only can understand what you are written no everyone it's in easy language right third which is voluntary accounts the accounts things like 
statement of comprehensive income statement of financial position statement of cash flow plus nose and compliance statement this are voluntary in a sense of how the accounts uh, things like comp uh, compliance statement whether you have complied the notes this are voluntary in the accounts okay governance a section devo devoted to compliance with the code that you are complying there's a section that you're complying with this code including all the provisions that are shown above then aob or any other business okay aob stands for any other business things like shareholder information like notification of agm annual general meeting are you notified or any dividend history or any shareholder taxation position these are voluntary stock exchange listing rules okay these are also source of regulation over disclosure this means that you anyway have to disclose it whether voluntary or not even if it's voluntary you have to disclose it why because it's the rule of the stock exchange listing rule that if you disclose you'll be uh, your company will be listed otherwise it will not be listed so it's regulated also in that way even if it's a voluntary disclosure that is also regulated you understanding through stock exchange listing rules now moving to ofr i've told you that is operating and financial review now it is known as business review what is it so in the business review let's see what the what are the things that is included very important this, see this is forward looking it's not something what happened in the past that they are recording it's not historical it's forward looking it's narrative also not in terms of numbers and all you write second earlier there were some high hopes that this business review might become mandatory okay but then uh, god knows what happened it was not accepted and it became it still is a is a voluntary okay so it was revoked as a mandatory requirement of the government in the uk and it was replaced with a softer business review earlier ofr it was known as ofr that it may become mandatory but now it is changed to softer side softer business review okay which is not mandatory in uk yes but not on the other side other parts of the world stakeholders such as institutional investors and environmental lobbyists hope that ofr would be a vehicle for so they they thought that through this ofr they could make some use of stakeholders like institutional investors and environment lobbyists how risk disclosure they thought that through this they could see how risky it will talk about the risk of the company risk disclosure and social and environmental reporting so they thought earlier regarding ofr now expansion of disclosure beyond the annual reports you have to disclose beyond the annual report also things like press release things like management forecast analyst presentation agm and information also on the corporate website on the websites and all you have information okay or it might be stand alone social and environmental reporting okay next and in addition to financial information these things are also there things like policies regarding what is your policy regarding your business ethics your environment your public policy uh, your public policy commitments okay Bec why this is so important this is not then the annual report it's beyond the annual report you are giving this information then why is it so important why why is not annual report enough because for the investor for the potential investors they might want to see what is your ethics they might want to see how committed you are for the environment to, are you taking care of the environment are you a corporate citizen through this other additional disclosure they will understand you all those things are not then the annual report okay next similarly organization should disclose all important risk factor all important risk factors are not there in the annual report okay 
So what are the uh, uh, areas that they might have to disclose under risk? They might include a risk that is specific to the industry. See, some industries are more riskier than others. You cannot do anything about it. No matter whatever you do, whatever tools or actions you do, you cannot minimize the risk. They are, it will be risky. And some, it's not very prone to risk, right? So according to the industry, the specific, uh, you can see how it is the risk or according to the geo geographical area. Some geographical area risk is more, some is less. Okay, financial market risk would be there. Okay, and risk relating to not just financial market risk, even environmental risk. This thing has to be there. Needs to be disclosed. Now, voluntary disclosure. Voluntary disclosure is we just went through that, right? Just uh, give me a minute. Just want to say something regarding. Okay. I was just wanted to confirm that it's mandatory or voluntary. Okay. So voluntary disclosure, as I told you, why do you give voluntary disclosure? Because there are some advantages of it. You might say that I have a choice, I will not disclose, but there are advantages of disclosing it. For example, one such advantage is strong disclosure will help you to attract capital. More and more investors will want to invest in your company. The more open you are, the more transparent your investor can trust you. They can rely on you. And it will help to maintain confidence also in that company. Second, it will promote the company. You are not, you don't know maybe, but you are promoting the company in a better light, in a positive light by disclosing it. So this can add as a marketing tool also. Okay. Third, public can understand better what is your structure, what is the activity that you do, the corporate policies and all. Third, sorry, fourth, shareholders might require access to regular, reliable or comparable information. See, shareholders when they want to invest, right, they need information where they can easily access which is which they can compare with other companies, which is reliable, which is regular. Not it should not be that once a year you are only disclosing, or twice once in two years you are disclosing. Not like that also. Frequently, you are disclosing. It's a reliable also, and it's comparable also. And weak disclosure, if you are not disclosing, okay, it 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 implies it's a, it's a signal that you might be unethical or you are trying to hide your unethical behavior that's why you're not disclosing even though it's not true but it is just a perception right in your mind you perceive uh, like that you imagine it like that it's just a assumption now sustainability sustainability itself is a topic huge topic it's a huge just like an ocean there is no specific uh, definition that this is sustainability. You don't need to know also the definition. It's not asked. But just know, in brief, sustainability is something that even if you are using the resources that is available to you today, today's generation, still after you use, it will be available for the future generation. Future generation does not have to suffer. Their quality of life will not be suffered because just because you are using the resources. We all know human wants are unlimited. Resources are limited. That's why we have economic issues. So when you're using the resources, natural resources, the environment, it should be sustainable. Sustainable means it should not, uh, it not, it should not be wiped off. That after you use the next generation might not get uh, get it. it. Should not be like that. That is unsustainable. So in short, that is the definition. Okay, you are providing what is best for you in terms of today and also for the indefinite future we don't know we are not saying one year or five years or ten years it could be indefinite future okay so this relates to the three aspect economic social and environment not just one aspect sustainability has to be in these three areas economic area social area and environmental area in all these three areas you have to you have to be sustainable okay companies like bp British Petroleum, Nokia, Shell, Volvo, they are, they are sustainable. If you want to see how sustainable they are, Google and search it. Or in YouTube, you will be finding out numerous videos out there. How they are sustainable. Companies like Shell, BP, how they are using their petrol, the oil. 
okay then so definition include the concept of triple bottom line what is triple bottom line the word triple means there are three areas already i've explained you economic social environment okay and the triple bottom line there is it's it is also known as three p's it stands for three b's also what is it three p stands for planet people and planet is for environmental people is for uh, social and profit profit is economic you understanding so now we are going to go through the first perspective that is economic perspective we are going to go through all the three perspective one by one economic perspective economic perspective says no matter whatever you do all the resources you have there is a limit to your growth you cannot keep on growing you cannot keep on expanding and expanding there should be some limit right so economic growth also there is some limit and these are some examples of unsustainable see sometimes it's not just important to know what is sustainable you need to know what is unsustainable also example of unsustainable activities include what when you're thinking for short term economic means profit okay in short so thinking for short term gain only things like increase in share price share price cannot keep on increasing 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 it never happens like that it will increase again it will fall again it will increase so if you're only thinking from the point of increasing share price you're not caring of the quality you're not caring of the well-being of the human or the planet it is unsustainable this is not something which you can sustain for the future generation second example you are paying bribes or you're forming a cartel cartel means when a group of people are formed together and they increase the prices for the customer okay one such example of cartel is opaque o p e z go and search on google more on that okay this is unethical and it's also unsustainable okay because you cannot keep on giving bribes you cannot keep on following cartels and do your activity it's not good for the long term uh, health of the market third suspect accounting treatments or underpayment of tax you are paying less tax than you are required to pay or your accounting treatment you are doing some manipulation there this is also unsustainable because if you are paying less tax it will affect future generation it affect why because government will not have enough money to invest on roads schools so education will suffer your infrastructure will suffer okay now moving on to the second perspective that is social social means people so the moment i say social people have to come in your mind human side okay so this perspective they recognize their organizations okay they feel or they perceive that organizations have a impact on communities impact on people it is a human we people that make up the environment that uh, so, sorry that make up a social it's known as social makeup right we are a society so according to a un report in 2001 they say they noted a large and an increasing difference between income and wealth okay with reference to richer and poorer nations rich is getting rich poor is becoming poorer okay then environmental perspective organizations definitely will have an impact on the environment where are we producing this product where are we selling this we are using the resources of the environment only on the land only we are doing this right we are extracting some minerals some resources we are using the land the water the energy where is it coming from environment so we will have an impact on the environment whether directly or indirectly that's not a question but we have an impact whether less or more but everyone has an impact okay so you have to take care of that resource otherwise it will it will not be there it will extinct so here these are some situations where it might be seen as a very a critical okay that you have to take care of the environment things like when you are using non renewable resources like oil gas or coal if you are in a company oil company gas company then taking care of economic perspective is very critical for you in other areas also it's there but this areas is more because you are more you are using resource of the environment more and more 
compared to someone who is giving services if i am working in a banking sector banking sector or pension i am not using so much of the natural resource of the environment then this question does not come use of non renewable resources or not but if i am in a company like oil company gas company or even if i am in a company like uh, let's say energy company making electricity and all still this is a very important factor for me then very critical factor use of non renewable resources or not so when in the exam you have to write about economic prospect think very carefully which industry you are at what is the company that is given to you which sector are you in then depending on that write your own second long term damage to the environment from carbon dioxide and cfc that is chlorofluorocarbon then we have whether future generation can enjoy the same standard of living given the finite nature of many resources wherever damage is long term okay things like from carbon dioxide economic perspective is very critical even for the last one next so this is an illustration to understand sustainability better okay it is from rio tinto rio tinto is uh, one of the world's largest mining corporations okay and it has its operations across the globe it includes like aluminium copper iron ore okay so this industry you know by reading it that it includes uh, it's in the mining industry this will tell you that economic perspective is very important for this sector you understanding obviously people uh, social and uh, economic perspective is there but this is more important it's more significant perspective okay so so uh, the size of their operations is what they extract the iron ore okay which is focused to exit 600 million tons of iron per year how much are they extracting 6 million sorry 600 million tons can you understand the size such a huge impact it has on the environment 600 million tons of iron ore and on top of that uh, non renewable resources are depleting okay so what did this company do this rio tinto they fought very hard so that they can improve their position so that they can show that they are taking care of they are they are into sustainable development so in 2007 what happened third paragraph rio tinto was listed on the futsi for good and dow jones sustainability index there are some sustainable index you don't need to know in depth not it will not be asked in the exam but for your understanding better understanding of uh, what is the sustainability index and how it works you can check which are the companies that are listed on food safe or good and what are the criteria how are they listed check check out those criteria and also dow jones but food safe or good is one of the best okay if you are listed on that means you are a sustainable company because there are so many criteria based on what they will tell you that you are sustainable sustainable or not they will give an index it's like a rank or a score or something like that so they have achieved a platinum rating like how we have for acca gold platinum partner then we have uh, we have gold we have silver things like that so they have achieved a platinum rating on the business in the corporate responsibility and on environment and community indexes there are so many indexes it might not be possible for a company to get score in all the indexes but one or two areas they might get so rio tinto was such and the last what was its environment goal to include a 10% reduction in fresh water usage okay they want to reduce the usage of fresh water by 10% and greenhouse gas by 4% within a 5 year period and they need to ensure that all sites achieve the iso 14001 certification within 2 years of acquisition or commissioning so this is a goal okay sustainability audit what is sustainability audit sustainability i'm sure you understood you have an idea in your mind 
what is sustainability audit we know financial audit we audit financial statements how do you audit sustainability so sustainability audit is a in-depth examination of entire organization's environmental management system okay you manage the organization's environmental system basically okay and this goes beyond the requirements of traditional environmental management system okay beyond that it goes like ISO 14001 it's not enough for you to say I have ISO 14001 so that means I'm certified that I am um, my company is sustainable you still need to audit it it still needs to get audited so this sustainability audit goes beyond that ISO 14001 even ISO 14001 uh, is also a certification but sustainability audit goes beyond that certification you understanding so if sustainability audit is done what happens for the customer it's good because it shows environmental credentials to customers customers can rely yes also the supply chain and also the other stakeholders and also nowadays more and more businesses are producing information on this three areas social economic and environmental performance so these are what ensures sustainability information they are producing now so it's more easy for you to audit someone to audit okay why are they doing that they are producing more and more information to meet regulatory requirements because nowadays as i told you earlier it was voluntary now what they are trying to do they are trying to make it mandatory so to meet that regulatory requirements they have to disclose information sustainability information has to be there now organization choose to get assurance okay on their sustainability information in order to why do they want to get assured by an auditor on the sustainability information okay financial statements we understand you want to show your because it's required by the law okay if financial statements is audited means you can rely but why sustainability information you want to get assurance number one because you want to see whether it is in line with the annual report or not the narrative disclosure is in line with the annual report or it's going against it either it might challenge either it might confirm it might confirm that whatever is there in the annual report is correct one second it might go against it it might challenge so for that reason second it is a complement of the it complements the internal process such as internal audit if you have done internal audit this is like it's complementing that or stakeholder engagement so through that trust of external stakeholders you can gain then again credibility of information it enhances that now there are some benefits of producing this sustainable information what are the benefits number one users whoever the user is any stakeholders nowadays what do they do they read this business sustainable information okay and also the assurance report also from that sustainable information when they want to make a major decision regarding whether they have to do transactions with this business or not example like whether they want to buy products from this company whether they want to supply goods to this company whether they want to invest in their business for all these decisions they read that sustainability information so if you give them the sustainability information the better it is for them second see knowing how sustainability information will be used okay if you know how it will be used it's more easier for you to uh decide what would be the scope of the report because you know that if i give this in the report it will match this this user this is the want of the user and if i give this report like this it will match the user's need okay because not every stakeholder might want to know in depth of sustainability information some wants to know some part some wants to know the other part so you have to decide that uh, what would be the scope of it okay then third it will also determine if the criteria used to evaluate information are suitable and available to use of a robot or not then additionally organization will be more it will make it will make uh, its uh, use of its resources more efficiently and achieve cost efficiencies cost will go down more sustainable you are automatically even if your aim was not to reduce the cost you will achieve cost efficiencies so it's a two-way advantage you are going to get uh, advantages on two sides double advantage 
environmental footprint there are two types of footprint when it comes to effects of economic activity any economic activity will have effect or i must say footprint two types of footprint are there one is environmental footprint the other one is social footprint first we are going to cover what is environmental footprint then we are going to go towards social footprint environmental footprint the word environment would be as understood something to do with environment so it evaluates the size of the company's impact on the environment on the environment so in three respect three areas number one how much resource has been consumed by the company the more you have consumed means your environment environmental footprint is bigger it's not good it's not a good sign bigger the environmental footprint it's not good in terms of energy or resource consumption second area are you polluting the environment are you harming the environment if it, that is also big not good if your pollution is increasing pollution is big not good third area is okay i think third does not been there so let this do okay a measurement of the resource consumption and pollution emission in terms of harm to the environment okay so you have to measure just knowing it is not enough you know what is your pollution is not enough you have to measure it you have to know in terms of the quantitative size how much is your pollution or how much energy you have consumed resource you have consumed and whether resources exist provision also oh, the third one is oh sorry those resource consumption and second is harm third one is whether the resource use is ex exists the provision or not let's say you have been given some amount of resources but your use is more than that it's not a good thing again it's a negative footprint okay it shows your activity is unsustainable you need more than what is given to you so how do you measure there are two ways of measuring uh, sustainability and the environmental footprint i'm talking about one is the caution approach what is the caution approach how do you measure sustainability in caution approach how much amount do you have consumed the resources or the amount of resource that is available compared to the actual use of that resource so you compare availability with the usage of the resource okay second this is very similar to triple bottom line tbl why because tbl also gives you a quantitative method of checking social and environmental footprint both the footprints and this is also same we are going to study further what is tbl a little bit later one example i have given to you is water usage so water usage can be compared with the amount of fresh water being generated so if your usage is greater than the generation then activity is not sustainable it's unsustainable your usage has to be less if you are having uh, one gallon of water and your usage is more than one gallon let's say two gallon so you are unsustainable your usage has to be less than your generation or equal to your generation but not more now progress towards sustainability let's say currently you are not sustainable but you are progressing towards sustainability that also can be measured you are comparing over a period of time you can compare the water usage over a period of time where the activity usage is less than production you are using less than the production then it is sustainable second approach i have told you first approach is caution approach next approach is subjective approach in subjective approach the word subjective says it's hard to measure right anything which is subjective is hard to measure subjective keeps changing this people might say this is the matter this people might say that is the thing okay this is based on your intentions on your goals how much you want to uh, we saw one example of rio tinto right that they want to reduce the water usage by 10% fresh water usage by 10% or something that is a subjective approach they are measuring based on their goals what is the intention have they achieved their goals or not second but it's hard because it's not quantified there's a lack of quantification that means progress that you maybe you are making a progress but it's hard to measure 
how can you measure your progress towards the intention can you say i have achieved my goals by 5% or 10% or 15% then example the millennium development goal of the united nations they had a goal united nations okay where they have a statement that says ensure environmental stability okay how do you measure it that they environmentally is uh, stable or not how do you measure it if i ask you you will not be having an answer because you cannot measure it and progress can be made towards uh, reducing maybe progress that if you reduce your carbon emissions means you are making a progress right obviously no one wants a higher carbon emissions reducing carbon emissions lower pollution but exact reduction that i have reduced by this million or 10% or 20% is very difficult it's not easy okay and also remember if you are reducing carbon emissions means you are reducing something somewhere else which might have a negative impact so always reduction in carbon emissions pollution is not a good thing it's good but up to a limit because if you are reducing too much means you are cutting down on something else somewhere else which is will have a negative impact overall in the long term for example you are increasing the resource in some other area to make that reduction in carbon emissions so you have to balance and it's very difficult in subjective approach now let us go through an example to understand and finish off this environmental footprint before i move on to social footprint okay there are three activities on your left hand column and on your right hand side how to decrease that environmental footprint will be given to you number one first activity is production of detergent okay when you make a detergent and all some environmental footprint is there and what are the actions that you do to reduce it so you use chemicals right that chemicals will have an environmental footprint for the detergent so how do you increase uh, decrease the impact you can improve the chemical formula so that your chemical uh, amount of chemical that you have to use is reduced second manufacture that product that detergent in fewer locations because if you are manufacturing it in a fewer locations you can have an economies of scale by having a lower cost and also emissions will be reduced okay second activity is you are transporting from manufacturing plant to the consumer transportation here energy is consumed air is polluted right so ways to reduce is again in a few locations you manufacture by using better logistic networks third activity is you package for the product so here whatever the amount of material or the type of material that you used in packaging could have an environmental footprint how to decrease it use cardboard rather than plastic okay because plastic is non renewable cardboard okay is renewable okay second decrease the weight of the packaging if you reduce the weight of the packaging less resource and transportation cost also will reduce so let us go through the example of environmental footprint let us do test understanding too to better understand it with a question before we move on to test understanding uh, sorry uh, social footprint test your understanding do suggest ways in which an airline could limit its environmental footprint airline we know it's a uh, industry which is uh, having a huge impact on environment so let's see there are three ways okay your answers could be different from this but try to attempt this answer on your own okay first discuss more efficient energy design with manufacturer so design your engine in such a way that is very efficient one way could be that second way to reduce is information give information to the customer what is that environmental impact of the air travel what happens by doing this i will tell you if you give information that shows you are accountable to the customer you obviously want to give positive information to the customer so to do that positive you have to do something positive right so that will help you to do your actions maybe you might be keep on uh, progress uh, right you might say no 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 i don't want to do uh, will be doing will be reducing the environmental impact it keeps on pending never happens okay you keep on postponing it 
okay but if you give information to customer you will become more accountable more responsible and you will actually take actions to do that and third is you limit the amount of package customers are allowed to carry which will how are you going to do that by giving some so, uh, some amount of uh, fine that they might have to give for additional backers that they are taking right so in these three ways now let us go to the social footprint social footprint this evaluates sustainability in three areas of capital okay that you have to be sustainable in these three areas of capital for you to have a positive social footprint one area is human capital that means in terms of your personal health your the knowledge that you acquire the skills experiences okay second is social capital how are you ha having a relationship with the network of people then third is constructed capital okay this includes material items like tools or technologies that you are making use of okay so you have to be sustainable in these three areas for you to have a positive social footprint now one example of social footprint is garment that set the taxation rate okay this is regarding social capital okay three types of capital human social and constructed capital this is the second type of capital social capital so regarding social capital government will set taxation rates okay and those tax rates are used for various services so when that amount you are raising that amount and it's less than the amount that is required for the provision of social capital then activities of society is unsustainable because amount that you need to raise is less than the amount that you have to give to the social capital that is required to give social capital you need more money than you can give right if you have less money the then required then it's unsustainable so in this case government have to raise their taxes that means companies will have to pay more tax okay note whenever note is there it's very important it's for your attention so this is a relatively a new area of research the social footprint this area okay so what watch out for the relevant articles in the press as part of your study as i've always told you everything will not be given to you you have to watch out videos various articles on this area especially this is a new okay this is a new area earlier textbook you will not find these things let us move on to more technical areas okay accounting for sustainability how do you account for it whenever you measure something there should be something where you account something where you put it it goes in a place like for to know your wealth your financial position or your performance what do you do you account either in the profit and loss account your uh, account for your profit and in the same way financial position you account for your assets and liabilities and things like that same way for sustainability also we have to account this is a technical area so you need to know these things here you cannot write general stuff okay full costing accounting it is fca okay full costing account what does it mean full costing means full total so it includes all the cost of the company activity total cost total cost means it includes environmental cost also social cost also economic cost also not just the direct cost or anything like that even if anything is there regarding environmental cost i will take it into account okay so all cost of action okay in the costing system they take it and it will include non financial cost also of certain actions that they take non financial cost also they will take need not be all financial cost and this is about internalizing all environmental cost into pnl earlier which cost comes in pnl it's not environmental cost administrative cost cost finance, uh, finance cost this dist, uh, distribution cost now they are taking environmental cost also in the pnl account that is known as full cost account okay that means you are making externality to externally uh, externality cost visible and chargeable as an expense now one example okay each 
type of accounting i'm going to explain you with an example to understand better let's take a car manufacturer okay in the car manufacturer we are going to take a full cost for this car manufacturer when we are going to cost okay so there is an initial outlay on a factory uh, usually regarding um, within a one year budget because car obviously you will not take five six years to make up a car right within one year car will be ready so first is that factory cost is there that land where the factory is okay however that factory will incur cost in every year it is used maybe that factory is there for one year but you are using it for the car manufacturer particular car for that one year but still that factory will be using for other cars also no every year so therefore the cost must be shown as being incurred over the life of the factory over the life of the factory you have to show that cost second location of the factory wherever the location of the factory also might incur cost maybe you don't have to give cash right there is no cash outflow that is involved but what happens some location you know is very uh, prime location you see you have to pay more why because of that because that location is there maybe it's in the central area or some attractive luxurious area so because of that location you have to pay more it's a cost for you even though you are not paying extra cash from your pocket so that's a cost for you right for example and also things like time lost from traffic use as workers attempt to reach the factory okay obviously some of the time you will be losing in the traffic no matter what you do so that time is lost so that is also cost then additional pollution is there from the car queues okay then so for all this there is no financial this thing do you have to pay anything extra no but pollution and all is there of the car and all that is waiting in the lines so things like that if you go by car pollution this goes in that stage okay beginning from the first the car being manufactured will have a finite life for five, five years five six years seven years some life is there okay it has a definite life it's not that forever finite life is there but company has no obligation to dispose of the used product at the end of that life do they have any obligation it is said that once the car the finite life is over company have to dispose that used product no right they can still keep that product and use it still you use that car after that finite life is over also and use it right there is no obligation fca will include the disposal cost also what if you dispose this used product at the end of the life it is that is also included and also the environmental damage okay some car manufacturers have started recognizing that cost also and they advertise also their cars they advertise their cars as being recyclable that means you can recycle even if the company does not actually carry out that recycling yet maybe they are not but they advertise next triple bottom line accounting first was full cost accounting now it is tbl accounting tbl accounting means takes into account all the three things economic social and environment okay financial economic performance was already there before they are taking two more extra environment and social performance also second again the concept of triple p people planet profit so let us start with the people one by one we'll go through all the three p's people is stakeholder interest simply you are taking care of the stakeholder earlier it was just shareholder in the financial reporting and all here you are taking other stakeholders interest also next for example a tbl business if you have triple bottom line business what do you do you pay your workers fair wages safe working environment is maintained no child labor is used okay this practices will reduce the profit right because it's a cost for you to give fair wages you have, might have to pay more wages you cannot pay very low wages so cost is there to maintain safe working environment you have to spend so profit is declining for the shareholders but on the other hand other stakeholders are benefiting your employees managers so similarly the company would promote its surrounding community okay maybe you might be giving some educational opportunities 
or a safe community to live in so this also there in the cost as in uh, which established by the cadbury the chocolate maker in england okay so chocolate maker in england bonville okay that this state was established by cadbury the chocolate maker in england one example then we have planet planet is environment whether practices are sustainable or not example production process if it's efficient in terms of resource used and also not much uh, toxic waste has been uh, toxic waste has been used then it's sustainable so you have to eliminate that you don't use any toxic waste or any environmental damaging output and the drive for environmental sustainability also means that tbl companies will not be involved in resource depletion that means whatever activities that will uh, cause your resource to wipe away you are not going to get involved in that that is the meaning of environmental stability one example is fish stocks you are maintaining the fish stock at a sustainable level and timber use is balanced by replanting to retain the resource in the future that means when you are cutting down a tree you plant another tree cut down a tree plant another tree so you are replacing it replant keep on replanting so that the trees are retained for the future understanding so you are keeping a balance over that timber use it's not just you are cutting wood and cutting all the trees and then you making woods and that's it no tree at the jungle it's not like that you are keeping a balance so you are sustainable last but not the least profit this is a normal bottom line okay it is normally measured in most businesses profit who does not measure profit tell me where we fully we say we don't measure profit we don't care about profit it's just planet of people no it does not happen so if you are a non tbl company non triple bottom line company you only want to increase your profit that's it shareholder return but if you are a tbl company yes it's true that you might want to increase your profit but you will be balancing the other two elements also people and planet you will keep profit align with those three understanding now we are moving to the management system okay this is more about systems and all so environmental accounting relates to the systems and all that you need to establish and maintain the system also to show the organization's impact on the environment two such examples are emas and iso 14000 they both are systems to manage environmental accounting system okay in fact emas is it focuses on disclosure of environmental system and iso 14000 is how well you are complying with the internal management uh, environmental system okay and many companies refer to both of this emas as well as iso 14000 in their csr report now we are going towards emas first and then iso 14000 emas stands for eco management and audit scheme if you write emas in the exam it will be understood because emas is a standard uh, short form some short forms that is created by you is not allowed to use in the exam but emas if you type emas in google it will come this will come up so this even use in the exam short form emas is allowed yes eco management and audit scheme okay this emas is a voluntary it's not mandatory by the way this is designed so that your environmental performance is improved second it requires that all the organization that are participating they have to frequently produce a public environmental statement public uh, frequently that how well they are going for their environmental performance are they improving they not improving they have to make a statement third how accurate that statement is how reliable that statement is needs to be checked by someone else so that your credibility is improved is uh, increased this is normally checked by an environmental verifier and they require organizations to implement the system also ems that is environmental management system coming to there are four key elements of the scheme number one legal requirement it is legally required second dialogue and reporting third performance is improved 
fourth employee involvement employee has to get involved in the scheme otherwise it will not work all these four elements one by one has to be there for this scheme to work otherwise it will not work it will not be successful you need employee for it for it to make work you it has to improve your environmental performance otherwise what's the use of having the system or having the scheme you need to report more frequently with your stakeholders otherwise what's the point and legal requirement also has to be there so coming to the iso 14000 this is a series of standards that deals with environmental management it's more or less similar looks very similar but they're different okay they have differences then they are not the same thing emas and iso 14000 okay this formulates the specifications for an ems that is environmental management system what should be the specification for that system this iso formulates that this compliance emas compliance is based on this recognition iso 14000 recognition but most organizations comply with both and they focus more on internal system whereas emas is on the external disclosure okay and if you have iso 14000 you see some companies it will be listed iso 14000 this company's iso 14000 that means they they have got the certificate iso 14000 certification has been given to this company okay but before that before you get the certificate you have to meet a number of requirements we don't know how many requirements are there you don't need to know all those requirements but just know that the number of requirements and it's very tough it's not easy it's very tough to meet those requirements you miss one and then you're gone you may not get the certificate for that year okay all the certification and everything is regarding what environmental management please understand now whatever whether evas or is supporting thousand there are benefits whatever the standard it is one reduce cost of waste management cost is reduced second there are savings in consumption of energy and materials third distribution cost is lower fourth corporate image uh, improves for among the regulators among your customer among the public and this is a framework for continuous improvement regarding your environmental performance it's not just that once i improve and i after that i don't care about the system no every time you have to improve it's continuous it's like a cycle it keeps on going never stops coming to the social auditing what is social auditing it demonstrates its benefits and limitations social economic and environment and also it measures the extent to which the organization achieves their objectives and it provides a process for environmental auditing let us go through the elements of social auditing there should be a statement of purpose there should be an external view there should be an internal view and then there should be a review and planning so under the statement of purpose let's see what it is there review results of last year's purpose and plan okay how you have reviewed the last year's purpose and plan it's there under the statement of purpose then we have this year's purpose and plan okay moving to the external view that comes under statement of purpose in the external view means you take the view of the external stakeholders internal view means you take the view of the inside stakeholders like board of directors staff volunteers okay and finally review and planning the fourth things that has to be there so here audit team the social audit team they manage the social audit and measure the performance they measure the performance that is ready for the input to the next year social audit whatever the output for this year's social audit will go as an input to the next year social audit understanding it's like the balance brought forward this year's balance uh, closing balance will be the next year's opening balance so it's like that it's carrying forward right it keeps on going i told you it's like a cycle it never stops so these are some typical sections from that report okay go check go check in google what are the sections in the social audit report literally you have to uh, be in that research section research mode all the time you have to keep on here and there you see a word go and research you don't need in depth but at least five minutes you can spend just to go through the report the i've always told you the better you research the more you know the more you keep yourself updated in sbl paper especially the more advantage you can take of this paper and the more high you can score trust me
on this when I'm saying this because I have been doing the same. Okay, and the marks that I've achieved for SBL, no doubt, was absolutely beyond. It's, it's wonderful marks that I've achieved for SBL. Okay, so because the one reason is because I used to research a lot. I see how what I go to the Google and check. Not that, not more than 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes I used to spend, not so much. Okay, it should not be that one hour, two hour you're spending on that word thing only, social audit report. You don't need. So, first it starts with an overview of the company. What is the overview of the company? Like financial features of financial accounts. Then we have, what is the company's stance regarding their employees? How they pay them? How they negotiate it? What is their job security? What are the policies on discrimination? Do they discriminate in areas of gender? Like, are they only taking female? Are they only taking male? Or are they taking both gender? Are they discriminating based on race or not? Are they taking the disabled people or not? So things like that. Then, it is very important that you don't always give the positive. You have to give balance, negative also. You should not be biased. So you have to give the uh, overview of product with negative environmental impact. Then the environmental impact of the company itself in terms of how much the company is polluting, what are their emission level, how much they are recycling, what are the health and safety policies, these things are there. So these are some sections which are there in the social audit report. Go through and see a life example to understand this better. Now, typical sections of a social audit report include this is, was there okay yeah it's it's continuation of that from the last slide social impact of the company what is the social impact in terms of their community support are they having a positive impact negative impact next what is the response if any from the company then so in effect social audit is what you are evaluating whether social or whether environmental their footprint given a uh, within an accounting period it's not that forever there should be some time period maybe within one year two year what is the so, uh, organization footprint from the external perspective that means from the stakeholders perspective not inside the organization that is the meaning of social audit coming to the environmental auditing how many auditing we went through sustainability auditing then we went through social audit now environmental auditing three types of audit what is the aim? Impact of the organization on the environment. So this also includes normally how, whether you have implemented ISO 14001 and EMAS. Then, provides the raw data for environmental accounting. So a, environmental audit contains three elements. What are the three elements? First, there should be some metrics. That means what should be measured and how you have to measure it. Second, there should be some uh, perform okay, performance measured against those metrics. How well you have performed against those metrics. Third, what is the level of variance or how much are you complying? 30%, 20% are you in line? How much are you deviating from it? So these three things needs to be there. Now, regarding this area, you have to go in your ACCA website under SBL study support resources and go to technical articles. There's a technical article named as risk and environmental auditing. Please do go and read it. Okay. These are some main areas that needs to be covered within the environmental audit. Normally it includes waste management and waste minimization, emissions to air, ground and ground water protection, surface water management, energy and utility consumption. So you don't memorize these areas, okay? This list that I've given you under this report, these things are there. Under this audit, these things are, don't memorize it, will not help you at all. Understanding is the key to pass as well. Just understand, that's it. If you're having this uh, doubt in mind, oh, I'm forgetting how will I write an exam? See, that's normally will happen in first few questions that you're solving, it will happen. It will take some time for you to get used to it. Automatically, when you sit to write and think about it, it, answers will come to you. You'll be able to write. 
it's just a fear that is stopping you those read your answers before you attempt or try to memorize answers from SBL will not help you because technical areas in SBL is less it is more like practical oriented paper you have to apply it in the case study that's why you cannot memorize anything unlike uh, papers like AFM or um, tax or uh, SBR where you can memorize certain standard rules and write in the exam. SBL is not like that. You cannot memorize. Because technical area is less in SBL. It's more like open-ended uh, questions. Open-ended area. Theories are very open-ended. You can interpret it in many different ways. It's very subjective paper. You can write it in any way. Everyone is free to write it in any way and all the answers might be correct. It's like that. So don't treat SBL like any other ACCA paper. If you are doing it, you are going in the wrong direction. Okay, so it's a warning I'm giving you beforehand. Um, so yeah, again, okay, it's continuation of the previous slide. Many areas in the environmental audit. Environmental agencies, protection of environmentally sensitive areas, product service to achieve, management of contractors, control of visitors, local issues coming to the environmental accounting see earlier we studied environmental auditing this is environmental accounting after you audit you account for it okay so this builds on two types of auditing social and environmental auditing okay so without social and this two auditing environmental and social auditing this will not be possible. You cannot account for environmental accounting. What is the aim of this accounting? To use the matrix that is produced. See, you will be using the matrix from an environmental audit. So you are using that and incorporating this into the environmental report. That is the whole idea. I have told you, accounting means you are accounting it. You are writing it somewhere. Whatever you have measured. So matrix. You have taken it from environmental audit now you are putting it in the environmental report that is known as environmental accounting so you are integrating environmental performance with your financial performance you understanding and through this what are you doing so that you can generate cost saving save your cost reduce environmental impact and better manage your resources benefits of this cost saving okay we all know explanation is given to you environmental improvement okay then corporate governance how corporate governance first two are easy to understand okay last let me explain you the last point you assist in the management of what environmental risk and operational cost also okay and also you are uh, including the publication of environmental environmental accounting disclosure in corporate documents such as annual or csr report so if you are doing it it will help you in corporate governance how because it will help you to manage your environment environmental risk better okay if you put it under csr report or annual report whatever the way you can manage your risk better operational cost also you can manage better if it's there now environmental accounting there are some impact on uh, measuring this okay examples of measuring impact on the environment for example you can monitor the water usage can you you can right you can see how much water you have used then you can monitor energy usage for example how much non-renewal how much renewable energy you have used third energy sorry inventory how much inventory has been derived from renewal sources compared to non-renewal you can measure waste emission and also carbons for companies carbon footprint that means amount of co2 generated now social footprint how can you measure social footprint that means the supply that you have got is it from sustainable or unsustainable sources then enhancing social capital that means 
uh, business community relationship is there you are providing on the job training so that you can assess some social groups okay companies like Jamie Oliver restaurant and Ben and Jerry's partner shop they have done it okay allowing employees paid time off to provide community services you see environmental footprint how do you measure reduction in waste promotion of sustainable activities that means metrics to ensure that dairy farming is sustainable now social and environmental reporting we are almost towards the end before we touch our last that is integrated reporting so all this while we have been measuring we have been auditing we have been accounting now comes reporting combine everything come to report there is no use if you report measure everything and then you don't report because the topic is reporting to stakeholders so except in some highly regulated situations like water water is a very highly regulated situations because everyone needs water it needs to be regulated by the government so except in highly regulated situations production of social and environmental report is voluntary that means in highly regulated areas water it is mandatory you have to give but in other areas your social and your environment environmental report is voluntary okay there's a problem with this problem is what should be the content of the report because it's voluntary there is no fixed standard and how do you measure it it's a problem but there are some frameworks which exist to help with that issue data gathering tools like through which you can gather the data things like global reporting initiative gri gri and account accountability double a thousand and iso 14000 these are some collection of standards okay but there's no essentially there's no underpinning compulsion to any of it there are some standards you follow you follow if you don't follow it's okay but there's no such compulsion that you have to do it okay that's a disadvantage on its own so environmental reporting will see you disclose whatever the environmental issue you have how you have performed against it you disclose it that is known as environmental reporting okay these are the areas so please go in google and check environmental reporting also the, to check the area of the report it includes measures of emissions pollution waste greenhouse gases consumption okay this information either it can be given included in the annual report or as a separate report it can be given social reporting okay that means cooperation should be concerned about society at large company should take care of the society at large not just itself okay this is generally context specific social reporting is hard to define because it's according to the situation according to the context that means content will vary from industry to industry of the report but these are some following issues that any company would consider things like human right issues workplace safety training and employee issues fair pay for employees and supplies any company you go these things are there no common considerations but for specific areas you have to see the industry okay minority and equity issues the continuation of the previous slide custom issue community involvement indigenous people social development These are issues, okay? Charitable public donations and sports sponsorship. Now, reason why additional information is useful. Additional information is useful, right? We want why. If you report on your social or environmental issues, means you are more aware to the risk. More aware to the risk means you will do actually do something to mitigate the risk. So beforehand, you are dealing with it. Before you suffer the liabilities, the liabilities which you are not aware of, now you know it. So you can minimize the impact. Because all this will lead to what? Reputational damage. Second, ethical performance, okay? If you give additional performance means social and environmental reporting, it shows that you are ethical. So if you are ethical, this also could be one 
factor that investor might take into account when they want to invest third employees may use this ethical performance as a criteria whether they want to work for their employer or not and some customers they say that we don't want to buy goods and services from such such companies because they are not taking care of us or the environment or things like that unethical companies in short so for those giving additional information is useful again continuation why it's useful if you give information beforehand when is voluntary even if it's some uh, rules or regulations are there regulations like they will not try to intervene they will not try to find out uh, in your like they will not try to come and search for anything in your company why because they can see everything is available there they will not try to suspect you so much you are in a good light from the point of the regulators they will not try to intervene there they will not regulate or oh, sorry they will not intervene so you are saving yourself from that side by disclosing and the more you disclose in your corporate governance ladder you will be climbing higher and higher okay because it shows you are internally developing right and also your board is strengthening so this all will have a positive impact on the share price and finally shareholder is the one who is going to as the owner he is going to have the right to such information shareholder because he is the owner he can demand he can say i want such, such information he has the right if he wants to add, demand additional information as much as he demands you have to give him because he is the owner so there's uh, there should be a reason right why this is, should be useful or should be there now areas where it's not useful cost biggest is cost it's very costly to give such information second ambiguous nature of measure it's not easy to measure like finance like your profit like your cash flow this is very difficult for that you can use your technical article environmental accounting and reporting related now last but not the least last topic for today and a very important topic for all your other acca paper is integrated reporting i have seen this coming in afm sbr other pay papers also that's why this topic is very important the most important i would say it does not mean other topics are not important but when there is a choice whether integrated reporting or other areas that we have covered just now it is integrated reporting that is given the importance from the examiner's point i'm talk talking okay because this area i have seen that they have asked what is the purpose integrated reporting i'm sure most of you know but for those who does not know let me tell you a brief maybe in one line or one sentence it's a statement above your financial statement okay it includes areas which is not there in the financial statements financial statements is what purely numbers right profit statement of cash flows integrated reporting takes the value of the organization overall entirely it's very short to the point it's not very lengthy but it's very narrative in nature it tells how company creates value over a period of time it's like a statement that they give this is voluntary in nature that is known as integrated integrated means all everything is connected and everything is given as a whole whole picture is given rather than just finance financial terms non financial things are also given in integrated reporting that is the meaning of integrated reporting if you understood that much it's enough all these definitions and things uh, that's why if you see integrated reporting this is very small my lecture on integrated reporting is not very big usually what happens when i go in youtube and i check videos on integrated reporting it's like 20 30 minutes they are speaking on integrated reporting when when i was going through this topic i didn't find it very useful to talk so much about it because only from the exams point of view whatever is important i'll be telling that other areas you can read on your own okay there's a question also in fact which we are going to do shortly after the completion of this so primary purpose is you are giving to the you are explaining the stakeholders how you are creating value over a period of time it could be short time it could be medium time it could be long time okay and it benefits all stakeholders benefit is to all the stakeholders not just your shareholder your employee your customer your supplier your regulator your local community your policy maker your business partner 
there are six types of capital from your exams point of view this is very important okay six types of capital and examples i've given i have not given so much of detail explanations not required first is financial capital things like your amount of bank notes your cash your shares your bonds that you're having this are finance you can measure in terms of money shares bonds bank notes second manufactured capital tools man machines that you're using why see this capital means through this capital you create value how do you create value you need human you need machines you need finance you need night so this uh, capital is made up of this uh, six areas only so you create value through this using the six capitals manufacture tools machines buildings intellectual capital you use the organization or the employees knowledge their skills their expertise their information so intellectual capital human capital they have certain skills certain knowledge right human capital social capital things like family another word for social capital is relational capital also you can say the relations that you build up with people through communities your family the businesses that you have the trade unions the schools voluntary organizations and the last natural capital is very easy minerals that you consume land the water the energy that you are using okay objectives what is objectives of integrated reporting it improves the quality of information because in the financial statements only finance this gives overall picture to all the stakeholders second to the point it's very efficient approach okay because all the factors are taken into account not just from the finance but from the human side from the intellectual side from the natural side third it enhances accountability as well as stewardship over the six capitals and also how they are independent on each other remember the six capitals they are dependent on each other if you are improving on one capital means you are not improving on another capital you are declining performance so you have to balance they are not independent they are dependent on each other and mainly why integrated reporting means they are telling keep an integrated thinking approach everything is connected with each other don't see one thing in an isolated form so you have to take care of all this so integrated thinking they are supporting so based on that you are going to take your decisions okay that is objective now another thing content element is another important thing one is content element the other one is guiding principle content element means these are the elements that has to be there in your integrated reporting it talks about it starts like this for it follows this order this hierarchy starts with organization overview what is the overview why the organization exist what is the extent and parameter you can give us what analysis who your competitors are what are your strengths things like that governance what are your governance structure your non executive director the risks that you have the structure that you have business model what is a business model risk and opportunity what is your risk what is your opportunity strategy your performance your outlook okay this are the elements then we are moving towards the seven guiding principles this will help you in order to prepare your integrated reporting these are like principles which will help you to prepare your integrated reporting so when you are making an integrated reporting think from the point of strategic point of view not short term strategic it should be future oriented forward looking and focus should be strategic long term second your information has to be connected to each other the six capitals third think from the point of stakeholder you are giving information to wide range of stakeholder not just shareholder you are giving information to customer to the supplier to the manufacturer thing okay materiality when you are giving information in integrated reporting it should be material information not immaterial conciseness keep it short and brief to the point not detailed reliability and completeness completeness is including everything it's not biased you are giving both positive and negative and it should be reliable it should come from reliable source okay you can you can even audit also integrated reporting also nowadays can be audited assurance report can be given on integrated reporting so that it becomes more 
reliable and last consistency and comparability it should be you should be able to compare it with other uh, entity and also it should be consistent that means from year to year you should be able to compare how are you improving on a financial capital how are you improving on human capital from this year to last year so it should be consistent the way you make an integrated reporting should not be that this year you are making it in some format other year you are making it in some other format it should be consistent because you have to be able to compare from year to year and also with different entity because there is not a standard format like how we have for financial statements you start with sales then you go by cost of sales then you go by gross profit there is no it's open ended voluntary nature so you have to be consistent okay now before i go to the conclusion of everything i summarize whatever i have discussed this is the end of the lecture uh, i'll be doing one question test understanding 3 on integrated reporting so let's do that test your understanding 3 so you are required to explain the four objectives of integrated reporting and how the use of integrated reporting could enable a more effective assessment of organizational performance so there are two requirements in this four objectives and how it could be more effective right regarding organizational performance let us read TREPS is a listed high street retailer that sells a range of goods such as food, drink, clothing, electrical goods, CDs, DVDs, car hood, and equipment. At a recent board meeting, the topic of IR was raised with some very mixed views in the discussion. Marketing data argued that this was simply a mixture of sustainability reporting and the financial report into a single communication intended mainly for investors. As such, it had a very little new to offer. so he is against integrated reporting you can see right negative and was just another compliance requirement whereas finance director says that this will give a great emphasis on different types of capital within the firm that would enable a more effective assessment of organizational performance so this is more like negative view regarding ir this is more like positive okay now this type of question you can expand in sb regarding ir where is where one party says it's negative the other says it's positive then you have to assess okay we have just went through the objectives of integrated reporting you have to give four not three not five i always say stick to the number that's given to you okay and the four you can give in four points like this so this are just basically up to here to here it's not needed it's just explanation of integrated reporting okay so this things is will directly go to the objectives okay here they have given you the definition of integrated reporting that it is a concise communication regarding organization strategy governance performance prospects this is uh, this comes from the content of ir you see okay so in this context of is and also whenever you talk in terms of ir first is that there is a concise communication regarding strategy governance and performance then you have to talk about the creation of value very important don't forget this has to be there creation of value over short medium and long term okay now whenever a question comes on integrated reporting i have seen students always mentioning the six capitals here six capitals has not been asked here they asked how the objectives four objectives and how it can improve the performance okay so please understand the question now let us go through integrated reporting objectives this four objectives you can take from your textbook this is pure knowledge you don't need any uh, link into the theory or any uh, case study or anything okay so whenever a question is asked in sbl remember there are two parts to it one in some part you might need uh, linking with the case study and some part is purely knowledge you just need your technical area from your sbl like this question objectives of integrated reporting which you can easily answer from your knowledge but on the other the second part okay here also you don't you don't need to refer to the case study so much you can answer on your own also but let's see the four objectives 
one is quality of, uh, to improve quality of information that is to the different stakeholders second is to give an efficient approach to corporate governance third is to enhance accountability and stewardship i'm not reading the this thing the entire answer that you also can do six capitals basically and fourth is to support integrated thinking and also in their decision making now we are coming to how it they can make a more effective assessment of organization performance based on ir how many bullet points are there one two three four five points are there first is earlier performance organization performance was based on financial ratios you calculate financial ratios you understand the performance now okay and by monitoring trends over time this was traditionally before next integrated reporting says they require organization to prepare broader range of information not just finance okay so integrated reporting how do you assess performance better because they cover both financial as well as non financial aspect next assessment of organization performance remember it is based on much broader content right it is broader in scope so the traditional assessment of then the traditional assessment so they should help stakeholders to better understand all the aspects of organization performance stakeholders will understand better and the finally the last is their focus is what value creation so if you are performing well in any capital that means your value is increasing well you are creating value okay so what is the objective primary objective of any organization maximizing shareholder wealth so you are bottom line is you are maximizing shareholder wealth right so let's conclude everything whatever we have discussed till now so let us summarize everything in this topic reporting to stakeholders summary shareholders are someone who are entitled to information from the directors they are agent okay so under that we have institutional investors okay we we studied that they are the one who manages funds that are invested by individuals they are big wealthy investors shareholders okay because they are intermediaries they come in between the agent and the principal it creates a complex ownership and control issues understanding then we went through shareholder activism how you can become more active use voting right have a dialogue with directors evaluate their government's disclosure and have a resolution for voting at agm annual general meeting then we went through general meetings two types of meeting agm and egm meetings are entitled to be attended by all the shareholders okay and they can vote agm and egm we went through the features also of agm and egm agm is frequent sorry once a year required by law 21 days notice period should be there agm on the other hand is if it's required you go for it not required by law proxy voting proxy voting is when you as a shareholder you're absent from the meeting and you give someone else to go on behalf of you and to vote also so it's known as proxy voting then we disclose usually via annual report normal right that's normal general meetings also you can disclose there are two types of disclosure one entry as well as mandatory one entry is you decide what to report mandatory is the law decides what you have to disclose and the best practice best practice says guidance provided by the governance code governance code is principle based right best practice so that's it for reporting to stakeholders thank you for watching and see you in the next video